So these final, more or less obligatory topics um, that we're going to be exploring this afternoon um, focus around the issue uh, at some level of uncertainty and dynamic models. And, and in this case, uh, agent-based and hybrid models. Um, so uh, we're gonna be exploring uh, in particular sensitivity analysis and one side of that in more depth, which is stochastic sensitivity analysis. We'll be exploring that with uh, this model we built up. We will then be continuing on to discuss uh, calibration. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with some slides here uh, and we will go and then uh, cover some um, some some uh, actual use of the model. So uh, can't remember for sure if I had a chance to post this slides. Um, but uh, broadly, uh, the first topic is sensitivity analysis and the second is calibration. And these at a mechanical level have um, uh, some distant similarities in terms of um, you're gonna be running the model over and over again uh, with a goal of exploring variability in the model, but the goals are rather different. For sensitivity analysis, we're seeking to assess the degree to which model output, or in some cases, the decisions to be made with the model differ um, in light of uncertainties associated with the model. For calibration, our goals are to um, arrive at improved estimates for parameters uh, in the model. Um, now, um, I, I spoke uh, during the week uh, about some aspects of uncertainty with, uh, with models. Um, and uh, the, the type that's um, perhaps most prominent in many disc discourses about models uh, is parameter uncertainty. It's uncertainty with regards to the values of parameters. Um, but uh, the truth is that um, there are a number of other types of uncertainty that are uh, that are at least as important, um, but where uh, the the sort of process of exploring them is not quite so uh, cut and dry. Um, so specifically, uh, there's uncertainty with respect to the structure of the model. Uh, uh, Wade uh, Blink, several occurred over lunch as well. Um, so there's uncertainty with respect to the structure of the model. There's... Um, Uncertainty in a stochastic model with respect to the underlying state of the model. Uh, after all, as time goes on, it has a specific state that is taking place in the world. But in a stochastic model, we have a, we have a variety of states which are possible in the simulation. And the whole sphere of statistical filtering deals with the challenge of um, seeking to estimate the state of the model that's actually being realized over time as new data comes in and as the, the, the model representing the system plays out. Um, more, more readily tractable for our discussion in this session um, is, is stochastic variability. And, and this has to do with understanding the variability uncertainty and model output um, associated with model stochastics. And that's the topic of some interactive work within this session. So let's um, let's just talk though a little bit more about some of these components. Um, the one that's really most widely explored within the literature is parameter uncertainty. And um, within this context, um, 
it is considered more or less required, um, something approaching being required to have sensitivity analyses included when one publishes results from one's model. Um, it's seen as uh, an essential best modeling practice because you are at a scientific level assessing the robustness uh, uh, of the model results. And for parameters, um, we have a lot of ways we can pursue this. Uh, one way is, uh, is involves uh, modifying a parameter um, independent of the others um, uh, in a systematic way and observing the results. Uh, another way would involve drawing values of that parameter from a distribution. This is called Monte Carlo analysis. Um, in other cases, we perform multi-way sensitivity analysis where we'll either systematically vary uh, perhaps in a in a uh, square or, or a cube or going higher to higher dimensions, a hypercube parameters at the same time or draw multiple ones from uh, from a distribution. Um, and and those are those are um, tasks very well supported within the any logic interface and which we'll be examining here. Um, the truth is that structural uncertainty, what might informally be called model uncertainty, although that's that's more blunt. It's really about the structure of the model, you know, concerns how how contingent are your results on on assumptions about the structure of the system. For example, if you were assuming um, a system which uh, posited um, no loss of immunity over time, how how fragile would that be if you did if you were to posit loss of immunity at a low rate, or if you are assuming no asymptomatic cases or asymptomatic carriers of some infection, how um, how fraud is that if you were to to change that assumption? Um, so uh, within that context, often we're looking at different uh, different model structures and uh, more manually assessing the degree to which the results vary. And it can be very helpful and it can be very practical. Um, we uh, were brought questions like that during the pandemic. I remember one in particular around the time of the Lalash investigation, which Wade was also involved with um, as a as a key player, having created that ABM. And uh, and there, one of the questions asked was, if you you know, are you assuming permanent immunity, and how would that change? If how would it change if you allowed for reinfection, et cetera? Um, right. Um, so, um, I think what we're going to do here is to equip you with adding support for assessing, um, the results of some of these, uh, variations in, um, exploring this uncertainty. So we're specifically going to be taking a model and exploring how do the results change with uh, in the context of model stochastics, so across different runs of the same model. Secondly, we'll see how that provides a an opportunity for also exploring parameter the effects of parameter uncertainty. Okay, so to this end, I had asked you a few minutes ago um, to see, whilst I was calling up my slides, to see if you could uh, call up the smoking and heart disease model, okay? And having done so, we're going to be saving this as version 12 of that model, okay? And this will incorporate the ability to examine over many runs of this model, 
um, the effects of a variability across those across those different simulations. Okay. Um, okay. So what we're going to do here is um, make use of any logic mechanisms for um, examining the effects of, of uh, a variability in the model. Um, and the one that's supported across all versions of any logic um, is an experiment type. So it's an experiment, a scenario that is designed to examine variability. And it's called a parameter variation experiment, but it doesn't always have to be used in a way that varies back parameters. So to add that, we're gonna go to the model as a whole. We're gonna right click, we're gonna say new, and we will add experiment, okay? And this is going to be a parameter variation experiment. And we will say, stochastic sensitivity analysis. So that's gonna be the first type we, we employ, okay? And you notice when you do this, you can say, from what previous scenario do we copy the settings, okay? asking while you're why you're calling it sensitivity analysis but not selecting sensitivity analysis as the type of experiment i thought i did select it oh um i'm you sorry parameter variability Pre oh like oh yeah analysis. yeah yeah no it's because um parameter vari uh variation is supported by all versions of any logic okay and uh, I believe sensitivity analysis is only for certain, for some, okay. and I'm trying to teach people on any okay. version who are any using any version of any logic. Some people may be using the uh, personal learning edition. Yes, wait. Yeah, I just want to add to that, like all the Monte Carlo and sensitivity analysis add that isn't available in the parameter variation experiment is an obnoxious setup to it. No. Okay. So there's nothing you can do with those that you can't with a bit of programming to get the parameter variation. So basically it tries to to make it like it, there's this so-called wizard which leads you through steps so that you can pre-specify your needs yeah, and when creating it. Graph and stuff, but the key point is you can't use autocomplete in it, so it always... Personally, it always frustrates me more than it helps. Yeah. Okay. So parameter variation experiment is kind of the 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 least common denominator and can be used to to realize all of those while still securing the benefits of things like autocomplete and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I find it's also um conceptually um easy to understand what's going on there when it auto creates a whole swack of stuff often you don't understand it and you have to go investigate wired wired it up that way i will note that if you're scanning a model it's easy to overlook the fact that scenarios that involve um that that use a parameter variation experiment and i'm not sure how many it it carries over to, but they have a little tick mark down here uh, in the lower right. Um, and um, that can sort of visually distinguish them from the rest of these scenarios, which run the model one time. So what's going to happen with the stochastic sensitivity analysis is that we're going to run the model many times. And for each time we run it, we are going to be recording the output in a way that will then get summarized. So I'd like to show you how this is done um, uh, and, and give you some mechanisms for, for doing it in your own work because it's nearly ubiquitous need. Before we do that, I, I do want to remind us 
what we see variability wise. So if we go to the baseline scenario, I'd remind us that um, this baseline scenario will run the model once. And I'm gonna draw your attention down to that randomness area associated with the baseline. And particularly, there are three options there um, with what's called a um, random seed, a fixed seed or a custom generator. And what we want is in fact a, uh, a random seed. We want every time it to generate different results, okay? So in other words, it's, it's gonna run it with different happenstance of random events over time. Um, uh, and for a parameter variation experiment, we're going to be looking and how these differ. So I just ran it once, the baseline, with the random seed. And what we see is, you know, a particular pattern. And I'm just gonna make, take note of, you know, a feature. I note that at time 50, the number of current smokers dipped markedly and the number of former smokers crested exactly at time 50. I'm, nothing what I'm saying is, is privileged, but um, that's what we see at time 50, former smoke, uh, current smokers down, former smokers up. Um, and uh, at, at the same time, at time 30, current smokers are up and former smokers are somewhat down. I, I'd say those just not because they're in any way, you know, uh, privileged points or, or points of foremost interest in themselves. But if we were to run this again, it's further to the point that each time we run this, we get somewhat different results. So here's time 30. And you can see the profile here looks very different. Very, very different. There's this peak before that. This is no longer a minimum or maximum of either um, the former smokers or current smokers. Uh, time 50, current smokers here are up and former smokers are down at time 50. So the point is each time we run this, it'll look kind of different. There will, however, be some orderliness to it. There'll be some regularities. And if we run again and again, we expect to see those regularities. This sensitivity, stochastic sensitivity analysis will summarize these results for us in a way that can see those regularities. That's the idea. Okay, so there were less, we, we, we are less inclined to overinterpret certain results. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to go to the sen stochastic sensitivity analysis. And you'll note that there's a parameters area. There's also a randomness area, okay? For the randomness, please set it to be random seed. This is an absolute prerequisite for meaningful stochastic sensitivity analysis. Because the whole idea of it is you're going to be running it again and again with different vagaries of the random number sequence. So you've got to run it each time with a different random number seed. Okay. So that's a, a prerequisite. Okay. Next, you notice that up in the parameters area, we can give it some direction as to how we want to vary parameters. In this case, we're not actually going to vary parameters. Um, in this particular scenario, this particular one. That's why it's called stochastic sensitive analysis. Our goal here, divide our difficulties. Our goal in this scenario is to examine the impact on model results of model outcomes of variability from stochastics. In other cases, we might be interested in understanding the impact on decision-making. 
you know, which scenario looks best. And, and that's an interesting problem because sometimes there may be variability in results between scenarios, excuse me, between, you know, stochastic values, but perhaps all of those, maybe sometimes they lead um, to, you know, higher levels, sometimes to lower levels, but it could be that the factors that lead scenario A to be at a higher level also needs lead scenario B to be at a higher level. Scenario A is low, scenario B is low, and it may be A is always better than B. Even though A and B both vary in their results quite a bit, they may vary in corresponding ways. Um, uh, that is not so much an issue with stochastic sensitive analysis. Since generally it's totally different sequences of random number generators, uh, random number needs with different scenarios. It's a bigger issue with parameter variation experiments when you're actually modifying parameters. We'll get to that, um, to that sort of analysis in a, in a bit. Okay, so this is a random seed. The next thing I want you to do is go up to freeform in the parameters area up here. And I'd like you to run it a hundred times. Okay, a hundred times. Okay. Now, for those seeking to understand this platform better, I will note that an alternative to doing it this way, saying free form 100, is you could just do it once and you could use 100 replications. Replications is any logics way of describing kind of realizations per what it calls iteration, which would be like, so if you're altering parameter values, um, for each of those parameter values, you might want to run it a variety of times. Here, it's kind of six of one, half dozen of the other. I think it's a little bit more transparent to do it this way, but reasonable people could argue about it. Okay, 100 runs. So what this is going to mean is that we're going to run the model 100 times in succession with the only differences being, look, the parameters are staying the same. The only differences will be the vagaries of the random number sequence. And we'll see what the results are. But to do that, we have to pro give ourselves a lens to see those results and to summarize them across these different runs. And that requires a bit of work. I mean, it is to that task that we will now bend our backs. Okay? So to that end, I would like you to open up the stochastic sensitivity analysis. Okay. And we are going to prepare the field for some information. We're going to get the vessels ready, the lens ready to examine certain events. And to do that, we're going to, there's going to be several optical components to our lens to extend the, the, the metaphor. So if you go to the palette, we're going to go to our trusty analysis library, which provides us with these ways of examining model output. And there are two types of output that we will be gleaning and summarizing across different runs of this model. And I'm and they they come in pairs. They come in pairs, okay? Um so one is a histogram We've actually dealt with histograms before, you may recall. Do you remember where we had a histogram in a previous session? Does anyone remember? 
what what were we what was the sort of data being summarized in the histogram? Does anyone remember? What number of infections, for example, or the cumulative time smoked? Remember those things? Okay. So there's a histogram, but do you remember what accompanied the histogram? It's a data set, a histogram data set. And that's actually the thing that does the, in a way, the heavier lifting analytically. It, it sort of figures out the, establishes the bins in which to count the number that fall into each bin and does the counting and so on. Okay, so the histogram here, so I dragged in a histogram data object to accompany it. Okay. So this histogram will be a cumulative deaths with heart disease histogram. Make you a copy of it because you can bet what the data is going to be called. Just the same thing, but with histogram data. If you want me to put that up on the big screen, I would not object. Um, so let me um, let me call up my notepad mumble. And here we are. That actually is rather pleasing that it remembers the, the settings. OK. So it says cumulative deaths with heart disease. So the, the histogram data object is cumulative heart deaths with heart disease histogram data. The histogram itself is cumulative deaths with heart disease histogram. Okay. And then we have to make the histogram refer to that data object, right? So it needs to know whence it's information for its histogram comes. So, fortunately, I copied its name, and I can use that for its title, Cumulative Deaths with Heart Disease. Um, uh, by model end. So, what this is going to do, so, so, what we're going to be showing in this histogram, each so a histogram summarizes data and, and counts the number of occurrences of that data where it fits into different bins, where it falls in certain ranges, right? The things being plotted here, the things that fall into one of those ranges or another are the count of cumulative heart disease deaths by the end of the simulation, of each simulation. It's gonna be running it again salvaging that value, putting it in this histogram again, salvaging that value, putting it in this histogram again, salvaging that data and putting in this histogram and so on. Okay, so this needs to depend on that same histogram data object that we just, we just um, created over here, this one here, this here one. So it needs to go like this. So the histogram, it depends on a histogram data object over there. And confusingly, it, it says histogram. Well, this is actually the histogram. This thing is the histogram data object. Make sure, though, that it compiles. Make sure that it's a happy camper. In TAs, you should be ready. There may be a explosion of... Confusion, That's it could be. Stochastics are possible. Okay. Okay, are we ready with this? Okay, so our next, so we're familiar with histogram. She should be familiar denizens of the menagerie of, of uh, HMA's modeling with, with any logic. Next, we're going to add a histogram 2D object. Now that is a newer beast and a noble beast at that.
perhaps even a beast of burden. Okay. And a 2D histogram comes in pairs as well. With what, with what other inhabitant of that palette might the 2D histogram depend? Histogram 2D data. Okay. Now for this, we, we actually have a variety of things we want to do. I'm not going to do all of them. We, we, we have a lot of different model outputs that occur when we, when we run that, when we run that model. Um, one might be the number of current smokers, for example. So I think I'll make this current smokers. Is that okay? Is that okay? Could make it people with heart disease. That would be another perfectly good one. But mutatis mutandis. You'll see how to do it for one. You can figure out how to do it for the others. Because we'll have to move quickly and live light, light on the land this, this session. Okay. So this is going to be called... We're called the histogram, histogram 2D. We'll call it current smokers trajectory histogram 2D. Trajectory, I'm trying to connote that it's over time. It's not just one value. The other one was one value. The histogram was plotting per run. It was getting one value from the model. Here we're getting a, a trajectory, okay? And then we have to configure the data, the histogram 2D data object. Can you guess what that name is gonna be? Mutatis mutandis, right? It's, it, yeah. Um, so 2D and Instagram 2D data. You learn to read camel case eventually, like seamlessly. You can you can read it like it's it's it it becomes very it grows on you. There we go. There we go. Tank, and then make the histogram 2D depend on the data object. Make it depend on. Okay. Um, so there we go. So this will be current smokers, and it's going to depend on the current, on the corresponding data object. Okay, now, there's a little bit more that has to be done here. So what did I do? I dragged in this 2D, histogram 2D, and it's going to specify in its data. And, and the histogram 2D is going to have as the X, so watch this, this is important. The X axis of the histogram 2D is going to be time, but actually blocks of time blocks of time, intervals. And the y-axis, I actually shouldn't say. Anyway, the y-axis is going to be, yeah, blocks of current, kind of current smokers. So a given, a given block here will be at a certain time range and interval and a certain range of a certain range of uh of uh current smokers at that time so it's almost like we could cut so what are, this is going to be clear once we display it with real data 
But the idea is going to be, and I'll come back to this explanation, that maybe I'll enfranchise folks here by imagine you cut it at a certain time it's as if there'll be a histogram coming out like this at that time there'll be a histogram counting the number of of cases where where the value at that time falls in this range or this range or this range this is a certain point in time this would be another one this would be another one um Actually, I said earlier that these are time intervals. That's the way it's shown. But I think it actually only summarizes it with data at a certain point in time within that within that range. Wade might be able to comment on that, but I think that's correct. Okay, so um although yeah, anyway, I, I could say given data for more than one point, maybe it just adds it in. But basically like a histogram counts the number of things that fall in this range or that range or this range. This one will count at a given time the number of things that fall in this range or this range or this range or this range. In this case, it'll be number of current smokers. Okay. So if we understand that that way, we're gonna have to set up things. Hmm. We're gonna have to set up things. We're gonna to have to set up the X value range and the Y value range, okay? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay, um, great. So we're gonna to have to think about what is the range um, on the x-axis. Um, well, the range is going to be time. So on the x-axis, I'm going to do, I'm going to have 100 intervals from 0 to 100. I'm going to have one histogram per time point. Well, per integer time point. Okay. And why? Well, and the the y axis is going to be current smokers. And I know the population is going to be a thousand. That's what I remember that the population is a thousand. I should probably go check that here. But I think the population was oh a hundred. Oh, um, are these all? Uh, okay, there we're with 100. So we'll do it with 100. That's fine. It'll show more variability that way. Okay. So for this 2D, this one will go from 0 to 100. And one number of intervals, 100. And it will go from 0 to 100. So it's going to count the number of times, the number of runs for which it falls in the range. The number of people infected is, you know, 20. Number of times it's 21, number of times it's 22, et cetera. That's the idea. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, sorry, I, I, I can't hear that. Um, I'll, I'll call up the chat here. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, that's not a bad idea. There, it, there is a way indeed, uh, Sala of, uh, setting this up to show envelopes. Um, so there's actually going to be two ways we can explore this and I'll show them. Um, one way in which it shows, uh, envelopes and, and they're not going to be, uh, the envelopes are not going to be around a, a mean uh, and showing the the R bars, that is the 95% confidence intervals around that mean. Rather, they're going to be credibility, or sorry, not credibility intervals, excuse me, quantiles. So they're going to be 
ranges of values within which, say, you can pick your 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 number here. Ninety percent of the runs fall have have results that fall within that range, um, and and it can summarize it. Um, it is true that we could show a result where we have a mean value and confidence intervals around the mean. But what you'll often find is that um, uh, so a couple things. One thing is it's not always actually unimodal. Sometimes it is um, bimodal. You can have cases where kind of bifurcates where it's either really, really low or it's high. Particularly for nonlinear models, you can very easily get that. Some runs it's high, other runs it's low, but in no runs is it in between. So either the outbreak dies out, doesn't happen, or it's taken off enough to spread. And by that point, there's lots of people with it. And if you take an envelope approach with error bars around a, you know, a, an estimate and a confidence interval, you'll be missing this this non-unimodal, in this case, bimodal structure. Um, so you have to be a bit careful with that. Um, but you you can do it with envelopes if if you uh, if you'd so like. You can also export it to an external package and and use analyses that are much more versatile or much more varied than what's built into any logic. But, you know, I, I want to emphasize, like, there is a real value of being able to run a simulation and see the results soon and iterate. And so, so you do have more options if you export externally. It's just, you gotta, you want to make sure that that doesn't compromise your insights by slowing down your learning cycle so much that you are sacrificing value from the model. Um, and only you may know your how automated your, your pipeline is. For example, during the pandemic, when we were serving all the provinces and the First Nations reserves in six provinces uh, and the, the health system here, um, we had automated our analysis pipeline. So we were running our models. This is with computational statistics, outputting data, and there were a whole an R analysis code that was running and generating really quite rich graphs, putting them into PDFs, mailing them to us so we could see it, et cetera. Anyway, um, uh, good good discussion. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's true. Wait, the the graphs are 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 animated, and you can, and you can actually interact with them and export them, or yeah, you can paste them into a spreadsheet. And so there's a certain amount of value from from interacting with them live. Are they perfect? No, no way. I mean, lots of things to be desired, but they have some trade offs that are material trade offs. They're not just kind of poor ciphers to what you can do in R, you know, Stata or, or SPSS or, yeah, uh, or, you know, uh, pick your, pick your package Python. Okay. Um, okay. So we've, we've um, done this. And by the way, Sala, there, see this show bins, show envelopes. I'm going to se select show bins. That actually shows like the histograms. Okay. Okay, so that's for the histogram 2D show bins. Okay, okay. Now, um, for this, so we set up this histogram 2D data. You notice you can configure envelopes here. Okay, so we've done the stuff that's kind of getting ready for the data. Now we got to get data into this. So you tell me, dear participants, where, so the data to be plotted here, the data to be shown in these graphs, the cumulative tests with heart disease, 
at by the model n times. That's what that means. The cumulative test by the model n times. That's why it's just a histogram, not a not something over time, not a histogram 2D. It's a histogram because it's the value at the end. It's a scalar value for each run that's being plotted. Histogram 2D's got to get information about trajectories over time, the, the lower one, and, and plot those in this histogram 2D. So where is that data going to come from? Where's What's going to be generating this data? Well, the runs of the model, right? You may remember, perhaps it's fading in your mind, but you may remember we started this session by setting up a number of runs. Remember that? So each of these times, 100 times in succession, one by one, they're going to be run. Actually, they can be run in parallel with multiple cores, but we'll see that. It's not actually one by one, but conceptually, you might think of it that way. One by one, they'll be running, and it's got to get data out of them and put it into this. Mm -hmm. Put it into these plots, or put it into these data objects, histogram 2D data and the histogram data, okay? So we're going to see how this is done, okay? Are we okay with that? Okay, so th this falling part has some has some code, and you have to know where to look, and that's why I'm telling you this. Okay, you have to know where to look, but once you do it here, you can do it mutatis mutandis in your own models. This shows the pattern. This cracks the code. Okay, are you ready? Okay, I'll show you how to crack the code. Okay. We're gonna go here to the to the scenario. And we're going to delve into an area where you might not normally think to penetrate. The Java actions area of this scenario. Java actions, folks. Okay. So in the Java actions area, we see a bunch of text boxes. But it's in the Java Actions area, and you could be encouraged to surmise that these hold would hold code, and you'd be correct in your speculation. Each of these is a handler, and just like we have handlers, like when you enter a state, or when you leave a state, or you cross a transition, each of these you can put some code. And insert that code, we will. So the job of this code is going to be two broad types of things. The first is when we're just getting started, we've got to clear the slate from data accumulated previously. And there's an asterisk, you know, shouldn't it be empty already if we're just starting it up? And I'm not going to go into that, but it, it's good hygiene. Clear the slate. There's you know, um, wash your hands for you. And secondly, we're going to have a salvaging of data from this model that's just being been run in Maine. We're going to read out the data, suck it out of that data, and we're going to stick it into these data, these data objects we just created, the 2D data, and this histogram data, the histogram 2D data and the histogram data. We're going to read out the requisite values and put them into these, to these data objects in this experiment. Now, I'm not sure the significance of this will have struck you. Thus far in this boot camp, 
we have been building your skills by placing widgets, elements of this model, in two broad places. Either they're in Maine or they're in some ancient class of some sort, right? Person's agent or school agent or whatever. And putting things in, right? But where we're putting them here is in the what? What are we looking at? What are we looking at here? What's on that canvas? What canvas blank? Wait, blank. Yeah, yeah. What canvas lies before us? This is the canvas of the what? I know you just went blank. Um, <laughs> this is the canvas of the what? Of the simulation. Of the, of the simulation, of the scenario. Yeah, That's exactly right. The experiment. It's the experiment. So this is in the experiment. We're, we're not adding this to Maine. No, no, no. Maine's only going to run once. But it's, sorry, I should say, each invocation of Maine will only, will, will go for one scenario, one, one, one trajectory. But it's the experiment which is going to run main again and again and again and again. And each time it runs it, it will salvage value from that time it's run main and stick them into this accumulating set here. So it's the experiment that's like the overarching structure with and it's it's firing off main many times. And each time it's when it when main is done running. The simulation is done at particular trajectory with particular values over time resulting. The experiment is going to is going to extract the values from main when it completes and put them into these data structures we just created. These these data structures, histogram 2D data and histogram data. So that's how it works. It's going to run it again and again and again. But before it does that, it has to wash its hands. It's going, to, it's going to clear these data structures within the experiment. So all this and all this code is running in the experiment. Most of the time, we don't really get involved as much with experiments. But you can do some pretty neat things. You can set up your whole user interface. You can have a sort of a high-level control panel view of the simulation and toggle things. Jenna... Um, has done quite a lot of this um, in her various models. Did I see a blink on the uh, Wade blink? Okay. Um, okay. Okay. By this point in the boot camp, <laughs> I got to wonder if it's like it's just total exhaustion or something. Okay. Okay. So you ready for this? Okay. Let's 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 give it a try. Um, okay, so we got to populate these things, but first we got to clear them. Let's go wash our hands if we may. Here we go. Okay, so where where we want to do it is uh, in the experiment setup, okay? Um, and actually do this in various places. Um, I do it in experiment setup um, normally, but I think you could do it actually before the experiment run. Um, so uh, I don't I don't feel that strongly about that. Um, uh, I guess I'll do it before each experiment run, before each time this experiment is run. Wait, do you care strongly about that? The the main difference from a user perspective is that the initial experiment setup is called when you run the experiment. When you create the experiment, yeah, yeah. The experiment run, if you yeah. were to stop it, right, run it again. Exactly. Per precisely. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And so the case in which they could possibly accumulate is like you stop it without closing the window and then you start it again. Then there could be cruft in that those places. You don't want to be there. And that's where we have to wash. We have to be sure to wash our hands of it. And that's why I'm putting it there. And before each experiment run. Wait, do I have your approval? 
good man. Okay, okay, so before each experiment run. Now I'm gonna show how this works because it's, you gotta get your head around, okay? I don't do this every boot camp, and you're, I, I, but generally this is a very good skills to have. So your job, we're, we're gonna focus on this one because it's a little bit simpler to think about first. And the other may require a tiny, a little bit of work in the other, in the other thing. So this histogram data, we're plotting within this histogram in the experiment, we're plotting a distribution of number of cumulative deaths from heart disease that have occurred in the runs of the model where that cumulative number is till the end of the model. So what's going to come out of each time we run the model is a single number, you know, 423. That's the number of deaths that occurred in that run of the model. In this case, it might be 43, right? Um, so we're going to be reading out a single number. That's the cumulative number of deaths. Where would that... So we've got to read our job. Our job is to read that out of the of the simulation that's just been run. So we've run it and it's gonna be at the final time and we're gonna read it out. I'm I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm sorry. I I should have washed our hands first. So the first thing we're gonna do is really simple. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm uh working with half a stack. So it's we're gonna clear cumulative deaths. Okay. Cumulative deaths with heart disease histogram reset. Oh no. Uh, 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 is it clear or what? What is it? Wait, uh, uh, mumble. It should be reset. It should be reset. Oh, it's data. I forgot the data. Rookie mistake. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's darn long names. Um, <laughs> okay. And the 2D histogram data. Histogram. Oh, 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 sorry. Ah, the other one, current smokers trajectory, the two data ones, um, the, the 2D data. That's what we want. Oh my gosh, look at that. There's a J there. Okay, dot reset. Okay, make sure it's, oops, semicolon. Do we have to, no, no, do we have to put a semicolon? Do we have to do it? Why is that? Do it. Do it. That's right. Okay. Okay. I'll never look at a Nike commercial again the same way. Uh, Next up, before typing the semicolon, just saying, no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Okay. Um. That's right. You, we could, you're saying name the semicolon Nona? <laughs> so I, I will tell you a story. So hackers have their own lexicon. And I, I referred to, you know, the frog, the twiddle, the tweet, and, and so on, right? Um, um, there's, there is, there's different subcultures with respect to names for the symbols on the keyboard that are used so much in programming. So I said that earlier in Britain, they tend to be called a little bit of a different, different name. Um, I think in Britain, like parentheses are called like, like, I can't remember, it's something brackets and and what we call curly brackets, they call braces or, or something like that. I can't remember what the deal is there. Um, but there's actually one that's called the Nathan Hale. It's called the Nathan Hale. Um, and it's what we would call asterisk, right? Right? And the joke is, so you may wonder why is it the Nathan Hale? And the joke is, now, does anyone know who Nathan Hale is? Jared might know. Okay. So Nathan Hale was an, an American revolutionary hero, broadly considered a patriot in the U.S., generally from a Canadian perspective. <laughs> well, I won't say, right? Um, but um, he was an a, 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 a American revolutionary hero. And he was captured by the British. And tragically, he was hung by the British. He was executed. It was terrible. But he's famous for, more famous for his, his closing words. 
um, before his last word, before he, he passed away, uh, before they executed Mark. Um, I regret that I only have one life uh, to, to risk for my country. Mm -hmm. And the joke is that he said, I only have one asterisk for my country. Um, <laughs> so that's why they called it a Nathan Hale. Um, <laughs> it is called the Nathan Hale among in the hacker circles. There's some old time hacker circles, and it's still. What's that? Uh, I'm I'm innocent of that, but I'm not sure. Like, like I'm gonna take a butcher's piece. I'm gonna take a look, but it rhymes with butcher's hook. So they they rhyme look with butcher's hook, and then they draw the rhyme the. Right. Well, that sounds, yeah, that sounds involved. Wow. Reminds me of like pig Latin or something like that. <laughs> um, but, um, okay. Uh, in any case, um, so we, we washed our hands there. Okay. And now our job is to rescue these values from the model after it's been run and stick them into these data structures, right? We have to, each time it runs, after each simulation run, we need to extract the requisite value we're interested in and stick it into the, the requisite data structure. So cumulative deaths from heart disease, I, I said that's gonna be a single number, a scalar, single count of people who died from heart disease for each run of the model, right? We run the model, there's a particular number that results, right? By the end of the model, right? You comfortable with that notion, right? I mean, just, just to make it very concrete, here's our, here's our main and we're gonna run mains one time with a simulation. It's not like we get a distribution out from running it once, we get a single darn number out, right? For this cumulative, oops, for this cumulative number of people who died with heart disease. There it is, it's this number that would emerge from this. It's 90, no, no, sorry. It's uh, 53 in this case, and this is 53. So we would read 53 out of it. So where can I find that number? Where can I find that cumulative number of people that died from heart disease within Maine? So it's running Maine and, it, and it's gonna have a reference to Maine at the end of the simulation, after the simulation is finished, it's gonna have this reference and it has to find this value it needs and suck it out of there. Where is that? Where can it find that value? Count deaths with heart disease. It's a variable there, do you see that? So let's, let's copy that name in case autocomplete doesn't work. Good practice. And, and then I'd like you to go back to this and we're going to go back now. Now we're selecting this whole experiment, this parameter variation experiment, and we're going to go down to after simulation run. You got to do it there because the simulation run has got to be good and done, got to be fully baked. It's all completed. Mm -hmm. And we are going to read that value out. But where are we going to put it? Where? Where are we going to put that value in this experiment? It stands before us, beckoning us if we only know where to look at it. Where is it? Where are we going to put that value in here? In the data set. Which data set? We're reading out the cumulative counts of people who died from heart disease. Is it going to go in the current smokers trajectory histogram 2D data? Or is it going to go in the cumulative deaths with heart disease histogram, uh, histogram data? Well, you might have guessed the latter one, right? It's going to go in this data thing. This is going to be the thing accumulating one after the other, after the other, after the other. We could run it a thousand times, 10,000 times. And each of those results, that single number from each is going to be stuck into here, stuck into here. So we can plot it in the histogram. Does that make sense? May we do this with your leave? Okay. Okay. So look, a general good rule is if you're about to write code in any logic and there's a little light bulb, look at the light bulb. 
take it from an old man. So let's go look at the light bulb. It says use root, the top level agent, root. Computer scientists have weird terminology sometimes. But the root is kind of the topmost thing. You would think it's like the lowest thing in a tree, right? Like the root, but it's the topmost thing because <laughs> yeah, that's what the tree is growing. That's right. Okay, so main is called root. Okay, and what are we going to read out? Well, we've got to read out cumulative. No, what is it called? Count? Count. Sorry, count. Count deaths with heart disease. That's what it is. You, you see that? But now we got to do something with it. We got to stick it into that histogram data. So this is a thing we want to read out. This is the single number. We just ran it. The, the, the model, we got out the single number. That's what this is. Where do we stick it? Okay, please don't say uh, <laughs> um, don't go there. Um, we stick it into this data structure. <laughs> okay. Um, and And so this is what we want to do. I'm going to put it in, in the big screen so you can see it. This is what we want. So this is this thing here. We're going to stick the value we rescued from the model. Remember, main is called root. We're going to read out of the root. We're going to use the root that points to main. We're going to say, give me your count test with heart disease. It gives us a number, 37 or something. And then we're going to stick that 37. We're going to add it into this thing, which is accumulating one by one. One by one, these values from running that model. Is that okay? Is that okay? Good or not? Okay. Okay. Who needs more time? Who needs TA help? Who is beyond help? Hmm. Okay. 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 Online. The TA stand ready. Many are sitting ready. Okay. 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 So, ladies and gentlemen, we haven't done the other one yet. The other is actually going to require a little bit of prep work. But let's, can we run this thing? Remember, run early, run often. But even more important, before that is build early, build often. So make sure it builds and make sure it's a happy camper. Okay. And now right click and do run. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. What am I doing? Um, yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. That's, that's interesting. Uh, I'm going to run it. I have to press this button and there we go. Okay, so you tell me what I what am I looking at? Just want to level set. What are we looking at here? What's on the upper part of the screen? What is that? We just ran that experiment we've been building. What's that? What is that? Distribution of death with heart disease. Distribution of deaths with heart disease over the hundred year period over which the, the simulation was run. That's exactly right. What's the mean value of it? 50, 53.71 across all those different runs. How many times did it run? How many times did it run those? Um, it ran the model uh, many times. How many? A hundred runs. We could have changed this to a thousand runs if we wanted to. It ran it lickety split. So let's let's do that. Do the young people here know what lickety split means? Yeah. So 
the central limit there of half the neighborhood. Yep. <laughs> yeah, large law of large numbers. Um, okay. There we go. Good thing we didn't break it. Yeah. So so right. Um so this is uh a histogram showing, you know, the results summarized across the thousand runs of the model of the of the cumulative number of heart disease deaths by the end by the end of those hundred years, right? Okay, now buoyed by that idea of showing uncertainty across the runs. Um, we're gonna we're gonna take that idea, which is manifested here, and now we're gonna extend it just one step further. We're gonna look at uncertainty between those runs of the simulation, but not uncertainty of a single number by the end of the model run, but uncertainty in the trajectory over time of the number of current smokers. That's what's going to be down here in the bottom plot, down here. We're going to have a 2D histogram because each of these is going to be time, and we're going to have a curve. For each of those runs, we're going to have particular numbers at each point in time, right? Particular numbers. After all, running it gives particular numbers, right? But we're going to run it 100 times or 1,000 times and we're going to get a distribution out for, for each of these points in time. We're going to get a distribution out of how the values from the model at that time of the number of current smokers. So that's what I'm going to show. Very common need. And thankfully, one that can be dispatched well. So I said I might need to, I might need to do a bit of prep work. And so we will steal ourselves for the task, okay? So we're gonna go to Maine. We're gonna go down Maine, okay? And we are going to look for that histogram of interest on what data it depends. Now, chances are we won't be in luck, but I just wanna check, check okay? Um, so select that histogram and go look for current smokers. What is this thing that lies before us? What is that? One recognizes the fox by its tail. What is that thing? What computed that? You can know, you can know by seeing that it's population.x. What is it? It's a statistic indeed, well-spoken. A statistic, ladies and gentlemen, if you can keep it. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, we need to accumulate those values. Right now, those are used and added to the plot, but we need a way of, of keeping them around until the model ends. Right now, they're added here, you know, over time, but they're not kept around in a repository. We're going to add such a repository. Yes, Wade. I know a sneaky way. You can read it out of the graph. Yeah, I. I no, I prefer prefer not to, because that I'm I'm afraid that will number one be a bit confusing, and number two, I'm a, I'm afraid it will make it. Like generally, I don't like to think of. I like to think of graphs as things we can add or delete at our pleasure, right? Yeah. Um, whereas uh, if if we have that secretly depending on it, it may cause, you know, distress. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so good idea. I, I speculated about that and Wade confirmed it, um, but yeah. Okay, so what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to add a repository, a, a collection, a, a way of keeping around the values of the current smokers till the end of the model. We actually saw when running a model, a data structure that does exactly that. It has a rather generic name, one that doesn't fire the blood, but it, 
it, it, it'll keep around values in a sequence over time for later use. What is that construct called? Does anyone remember? It's actually, well, a variable will keep up, but once you overwrite that variable, as we say in computer science, once you clobber that variable, you've forgotten the old value. So a variable, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good thing to put forward. I welcome the suggestion. Log the variable at the end of the simulation then? Sorry? Aren't you going to log the variable at the end of the... Well, you can do logging in these models, but we're going to instead use... Or you're going to put it... Into... We're going to put it in a data set. That's what it's called. It's called a data set. And in fact, there's one that stands there right now, the annual heart disease incidence data set. Hmm? Are we, are, see that? So we're gonna we're gonna just add another one just like that. This is gonna be called annual annual current smoker count and prevalent data set. Yeah, thanks. I'm gonna so I I have fairly poor aesthetic fairly poor aesthetic discipline. And and my students, some of my students are much, much better. Um, and I, I salute them in their prettification of their models. And it's it's not something to be taken lightly. It's a it's a personal character flaw on my part. And and I stand to be corrected by it. About it. Um I should I should really, really commit to improving my aesthetics. Um, okay, so so this this is a data set. We'll keep up to a hundred latest samples. We'll use time as the horizontal axis value. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And we have we have two choices for this. We can. Either we could either ride atop this, or we could ever record automatically every every one year. Now you may think that this would be a good place to put it, and I, I gotta say it ain't bad. But this thing is involved in like it it clears the tally. It, it has a job to do, and I. I, I, it has a rather focused job to do. And I, I don't want to turn it into a general reporting event because that will distract us from the real job it has to do, which is maintaining this discipline of, of, of clearing out a tally and but recording it before then. So I don't want to encroft it with stuff. So I'm going to do it by update data automatically every one year. And what am I going to update this with? What's going to be stuck in here? Riddle me that, folks. Riddle me that. Number of current yeah, number of current smokers. How do I, where can I get the number of current smokers? You put, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the credit lies not in our stars, but in, in ourselves. You created, what did you create that will give the number of current? You gave a statistic. Population dot current smokers. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Oh my gosh, current smokers. I mean, it's a it's a thing of beauty when you can use your earlier mechanisms to simplify your life. You've built well. You've built the right abstractions, and you can reuse them again and again. Okay, so this is what I've done. I've accumulated in this data set now. That was the prep work of which I spoke. 
that was the scut work that may have that may have scared you when I mentioned it. But it ain't too bad in my judgment. It ain't too sloppy. Okay, so let's take this. And what are we going to do with it now? What are we going to do with it? We're going to... Yeah, we're going to go to sensitivity analysis. That's right. That's right. We're going to add it. And something will happen there that, that may surprise you. For some of you, it may inspire you or excite you. I hope it will not disgust anyone. But we're going to make use of it as a data set as a whole. Here we go. Do you remember in this in this sensitivity analysis? Do you remember down in these we were in the Java actions, we had to wash our hands, and then we accumulated this value in that other histogram? Remember that? Now we will accumulate this, but we'll accumulate an entire data set at once in one fell swoop. Hmm. Um, okay, here we go. Current smoke. Smokers trajectory histogram 2D data. And what are we going to do there? We're going to add. And what are we going to add? Root dot. What is root referring to? Main. Dot what? Annual current. The thing we just added. Annual current smoker prevalence data set. That's what it is. That's what it is. You ready? Okay, so so this may, again, this may surprise you. Let me put these, I'm gonna put both these bits of code up so you can see their relationship to one another, okay? And, and I'm going to first build to make sure we're not, we don't have any problems, yeah. Okay, so, so let me, what what you may be seeing may confuse you, and I I I get that fact of, you know why why it could be a little bit disorienting. Okay, so. No. Okay, so. This is where I wish I had one of those. Um, so the first of these things, um, the first of these lines, that first line, we're going to read out this. What is this thing that we're reading out of me this, this, for this top one? Root dot count date that it says. What is it? It's a it's a single number, right? Like 37, 26, 53, right? And we're sticking that into our histogram data. It's, right? And then that gets plotted in that histogram, right? Yeah. Hmm? The second line. Parallel, right? It has to be right? This data object add is the same as this data object add in the first one. Looks, looks for all intents and purposes, pretty much the same. In a sense, the details change. But what is it reading out here? What is this thing that it, it's reading out of main? It's a what? It's not a number. It's not a single number. It's a data set. It's, it's values over time. That we just accumulate. So maybe at time zero, it's zero. Maybe at time one, it's two. Maybe at time three, it's one. You know, maybe at time four, it's four, right? Um, we're reading out that data set. It's a data set. That's fine. There's nothing problematic about this. Maybe for some people, totally new to seeing these things, it somehow seemed weird to read a bunch, but it's just a, it's a data structure. It's a reference to a data structure. Same thing. 
a data set. Now add to this 2D data that, that data set. And 2D histogram objects know how to take a data set over time and incorporate it into their 2D histogram. That's what they do. That's what their job is. Mm -hmm. That's part of their job in life. To take a data set and incorporate it into their 2D data set. Take it into account in those bins and, and so on. So that's what's going on here. Now, I will share with you that sometimes it can be a bit finicky to get make sure all the details are correct with like the bins here and stuff like that. So sometimes it it, it requires a bit of sort of butzing with the settings here in the 2D histogram data set, but I'd like to run it now. Can we run it? We did build it and it seemed happy. If yours is not happy upon building, make a TA happy by telling them and they will help you. Okay. Okay. And now we will run this thing. And look at look what's going on below. Do you see what's going on below? Can you see that? Can you see it on your screens? I take it that's a yes. No? Okay, TA help, sector two, front row. Okay. So, so what I see here, this is a bit washed out, but what I see is a rise here. So I can see it more clearly on my, my screen there, yes. but I see a rise here and, and there's kind of a band mm -hmm. and, and it's going down here. You can kind of see it a little bit more clearly there, a little bit more clearly there. It's quite dark here around zero towards the beginnings. And it's quite dark down there. So what is this what is this telling us about the variability between different runs of this across different stochastics? Can anyone say? What is this what is this kind of saying? Across different runs of this model, how much variability is there? It's all just, you know, all scrambled. You don't know what to think. It's it could be any value, or is it fairly tight? Fairly tight. It's actually fairly tight. I mean, it, maybe you can't see it really quite as clearly as I can, but the, like the lowest value, look at this. In fact, it even reports on that. That's, that's pretty slick. That's actually pretty slick. Do you see that weight? Yeah. Um, so, so, um, okay, so that's the PDF value. So this is a histogram, right? Um, and, you know, there's, Basically, the first few values are kind of down around here, and there are some values, it looks like, way up here. But but by and large, the high probability density region is right in this area, right in that area. Um, and, and why is it darker here? Can anyone say? Why is it dark around zero? Remember, it's darker where there's lots of runs in that in those bins. So why is it really dark here? Why is there lots of runs around zero at about time close to zero? Because the cumulative number of deaths starts at what value? Zero. There's no one that dies before time zero. So... So all of them start from zero, then they add all of them. You're wait a minute, wait a minute. This is, what, what the heck? Wait, 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 wait. That doesn't make any sense. This is cumulative. This is cumulative. Oh, we were looking at current. Oh, okay. Ugh. Thank you, thank you, it's not cumulative. Thank you, current smokers, that's current smokers. So everyone, the reason it starts at zero is because in this model, everyone starts as a what? Non-smoker. You see that? 
Now, okay, I kind of feel guilty because I didn't show you yet. I didn't show you how to allow people to start in different states. Do you want to see it? It would take about five minutes. Five, a 10 at the tops. You ready to see it? Oh, we could see it in a sweet way. Custom distribution, Wade. But we need an option list. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do it. I'm going to, so I could show it to you in a bad way. Or I could show it to you in a good way. I could do a bad way in five minutes. I could do a good way in 10 minutes for sure. But it's just a branch of two options for this one, right? Um, no, because we have to divide them on never occurrence former. So we're going to divide it, divide up um, uh, between all three. What fraction go here, here? Oh, okay. Um, I, I understand. You, you're saying, well, yeah, in any case. Um, okay, so you could start as a former. Yeah, or you, you could, we'll, we'll allow people to start as a former, you know, positing the before they smoke. Yeah. Okay. But are we starting at age zero? No one's going to enter the coming out of the world. Okay. Smoker. That's <laughs> okay. But that's another thing I'm feeling guilty about. Um, <laughs> Because I'm thinking... It's not, not going to hand you a cigarette. Yeah, that's true. That's that's true. But I've been thinking about allowing births to happen so you could see the magic of childbirth. I and have that source. Um, what's that? I have that source. Uh, well, we could have it be exogenous. <laughs> um, the stork. The stork. We're going to add a stork agent. Um, uh, <laughs> maybe that's not so magic of childbirth, but... Um, Okay, so um, moving right along, um, actually, that would be a that would be a good thing. We we actually have a bit of time to do that. So okay, infants, infants can be born addicted to opiates. Can they be born addicted to nicotine? Is that a they thing? can be? Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's some so, yeah, okay. there's some interesting studies related to that. Yeah. Okay. Um. No, we're gonna we're gonna do two things here. Okay. So the first thing is we're going to, so this is version 12 of the model. This is, this is like, it's working model. It's good. We're, we're, you know, we should probably label those graphs, right? We should probably, um, probably call it something. Um, but I think I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it like this. Um, and, and then I want you to, okay. So, um, yeah, so it, it does label this. Okay, current smokers. Okay, good. Um, let's see what would happen if we did show envelopes. Let's try that. Now it's going to show, like in a unimodal type of way, around the medium. So I'm going to run it now. All I did is I tweaked one setting, ladies and gentlemen. I tweaked... For this thing, I tweak show envelopes. Let's run that. And now we're going to see something a little bit different. Now it's quantiles around the median. You know, so the median is in the middle. And successively outwards, you get different quantiles. And you can set the number of quantiles uh, for this. Um, uh, I think that is set over in this histogram 2D data object, the so-called envelopes. So like the 25th percentile, the 50th, and the 75th. So if you want to set up deciles or you want to set up, these are quantiles, right? But you can see that is a rather pleasant prospect. But it does hide cases where it's non-unimodal, right? Um, it it's 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 really good for unimodal distribution. So in this case, it's quite quite pleasing, right? It's quite easy to see. Are we okay with that? Okay, so let's um let's do this distribution. Um okay, so first of all, I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna save this model and I'm gonna make it available for you to use. Okay, let's break for let's break for five minutes. We'll come back and we will. We will continue, um, and we're going to do two things in in quick succession. Number one, 
we're going to divide people up into different bins, um, and different smoking status at the initial time. We'll see how that's done. And we'll introduce custom distributions and option lists at the same time, kind of a trifecta. The second thing we're going to do is introduce open populations. And you'll see a rather, a, a rather slick way to do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Five minutes. Um, so back in, uh, back in five. Thank you. I'll post this, uh, post this now. Thank you, Wade.
Okay, so we're gonna get going. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we will get the recording. Oh.